today to talk about privacy and the complexity of simple queries. Uh, and it's a single talk session. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, okay, a little echoey. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. So I'm really excited to be here. This is my second live talk of the post COVID era. So I'm still very happy to be able to give live talks. Um, I will say first, so I'm doing a couple things I've never really done before in a talk like this. Uh, the first is that I'm wearing a mask. So if you're having trouble like hearing me or if I'm kind of mumbling or something, please let me know. Uh, the second is uh, I see now that everybody likes to doodle on slides by hand. So I'm kind of upping the game by doing entirely handwritten slides. I've never done this before. I hope uh, I haven't been this self-conscious about my handwriting since eighth grade. I hope that it comes out okay. But please let me know uh, if you can't read anything or if you need me to just like rewrite something or zoom in or, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> right, we were saying this is basically what all talks were. This is what all talks were in, in your day, right? It was handwritten slides projected. Um, my dad still has a lot of his. Uh, sorry. You know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I have never personally witnessed a talk given on an overhead projector. Can't hear on Zoom. Can't hear on Zoom. Oh, oh he says I can. Yeah, okay. I it seems like it's not. Okay, problem. so it's just him. Okay. All right, great. Sorry, Elias. I'll give you a recap later. <laughs> okay, so uh, the other thing I'm doing that's a little different. So um, this is on rigorous evidence for trade-offs between for information computation trade-offs. And uh, Sam emailed me and said, John, you're really bad at making things efficient. So maybe you could tell us about that. And I said, sure, that's a great way to invite someone to give a talk. So I will do that. So I'm not really going to talk about like a specific paper or anything terribly recent. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to talk about one open problem in the area of differential privacy that is uh, something that's been kind of at like the the center of a lot of research. So it's sort of one problem that kind of drove a lot of the research on the topic at one point and where progress is kind of stalled. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of like describe the problem and kind of what we know about it and, and how we sort of got to like that problem. And then I'm going to describe what we do know about it and the kinds of approaches people have applied and sort of where they got stuck. And in the process, I'm not going to be able to give you a lot of rigorous evidence for information computation trade-offs. I'm going to be able to sort of point you to a problem where this phenomenon currently arises. And I think the people in this uh, room and the people watching on Zoom, at least those who can hear me, not Ilias, can possibly help. So um, as a result, basically, I'm going to be sort of telling a story. It's not going to be a very technical talk. And so if you ask me any questions, that would be great. Like the more sort of interactive this is, I think the more uh, everyone will learn from it, including me. So let's begin. So what's what's like the high level story of the problem that we're trying to solve? So uh, we're going to start out with just like a very basic setup for like statistical estimation. We have some population P. We draw some sample X. Um, for today, you know, you can just think. Um, you can definitely just think of uh, IID samples. And we want to make use this sample to make some conclusions about the population. So this could essentially be anything, right? It could be some estimate of the mean of the population. It could be some predictive classifier, um, some hypothesis test. It's uh, you know really in this level of generality, it's really not important what it is. And the goal, of course, is not to learn anything really about the sample per se. The goal is to learn about the population. But the sample we collect are consists of real people's data. So for example, um, some of this stuff has come up in the context of working with the Census Bureau, where the data set, of course, is you know actual people whose doors were knocked on and had to fill out a card. Um, or users who use some, you know, some system like Google or Facebook and want to uh, have that data used in a certain way. So from the perspective of the person analyzing the data, the goal is just to learn about the population. But the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a sample which represents real people's data. And so we have to protect the privacy of that data. So we have to ensure that we learn about the population in a way that doesn't reveal too much about the people actually in the sample. And like at first blush, this sounds 
like a, a great situation because what, what we're trying to do, make conclusions about the population, is that it perfectly aligned with the privacy goal. We really only want the sample as a means to understanding this population. In fact, in, in some sort of sense, really our goal is to avoid learning anything that is just specific to the sample and only to learn things that are true about the population. Right? So for example, I might want to learn uh, the sort of canonical example is like I might want to learn that uh, whether or not you smoke is correlated with whether or not you're going to get lung cancer at some point in your life. But if I'm trying to conduct a study to find that out, I really don't inherently care about any one person, whether they smoke or whether they have cancer. It's, in fact, my goal is not to learn about one person in the data set, it's to learn about the population. So you might think that there's just not even a problem here. Maybe a well-designed estimator or machine learning algorithm would inherently respect the privacy of the sample because in order to do a good job of learning about the population, it should not be overfitting to the sample. But in fact, most out-of-the-box statistical methods um, do reveal a lot of information about the individuals in the sample, sort of in, in non-obvious ways. So um, you know, I'm not talking about methods that sort of output, say, a representative data set where that data set obviously contains individual samples, even methods that reveal something like regression coefficients or the parameters of a predictive neural net or the mean of the data set can reveal a lot of information about the samples in fairly surprising ways and often inherently do so. So often there are sort of inherent requirements that any good method for inferring something about the population must in fact reveal a lot about the sample. So this has been formalized or observed in like many different contexts. Um, I'll point to a couple lines of work. So the sort of whole field of differential privacy was kind of launched by a paper on something called reconstruction attacks uh, by Dinur and Nisim. This is like a, a seminal paper that has been really influential in data privacy. And what it basically showed is that for many natural estimation problems, you can just sort of reverse this process, or to a large extent, you can reverse this process and go from some seemingly benign looking output, like some, some population, some output that describes the population back to the sample or a large part of the sample that was used to produce it. Um, in the context of, of high dimensional statistics, there's been a, a more recent line of work on something called membership inference, where you don't reconstruct the data set, but you can sort of identify whether or not a person was included in the sample, which can be itself a privacy violation. Um, this sort of began with an influential attack uh, it's referred to as Homer et al. on genomic data sets. Um, and also in the machine learning community, people have started to look at, uh, in some ways, sort of more blatant types of privacy violations where kind of large uh, neural networks will effectively remember training data. So the predictive model, when kind of used in the right way, you, you can actually extract from it specific examples it was trained on. So kind of you know, high entropy, unique examples that really like don't reflect any sort of population trend. They really just reflect like one training example in the world. Um, so that was first shown in a paper called The Secret Share by Carlini et al., but it's become sort of an active like, general area of research. And there's been an interesting line of work on sort of to what extent uh, machine learning in certain settings essentially requires this type of memorization. So um, you know, the gist up to this point right, is that there are there's a sort of a rich theory of attacks on privacy, the routes for breaching privacy from seemingly fairly benign uh, statistical information. And the kind of conclusion is that unless you explicitly do something to rule these types of attacks out, they'll probably be possible. So uh, the kind of subtext of a lot of this work you know, most of these papers sort of begin with somebody proposed a heuristic to prevent privacy violations, and lo and behold, another attack was possible. So there should really be some kind of rigorous way of arguing that not only these attacks don't work, but sort of a broad class of, of attacks are not possible. And for the past 15 years, uh, the kind of criteria that's emerged is something called differential privacy. So the paper that introduced this was by Dwork McSherry, Nisim, and Smith in 2006. Um, and it's been a very active area of, of study. And what it is is basically a certain kind of robustness condition that an algorithm can satisfy. Um, so the idea is, suppose we have a data set X. So that's the top data set here. And you know, hypothetically, you're like some person in this data set. 
So just imagine that you are a person in this data set and you're a little worried about your privacy. And we're going to run the data set through some kind of mechanism. For some reason, algorithms in this literature are called mechanisms. Uh, I tried to change this, and a journal reviewer told me the ship had sailed and I needed to, to stop doing that. So I've just given up. But for some reason, algorithms are mechanisms in this literature. So you're going to run the data set through some mechanism, and it's going to produce some conclusion, whatever it is, maybe something about the population. Uh, but it, it really doesn't matter, some conclusion. And you're worried that that conclusion will reveal something about you. But you're not just worried that it'll reveal something about you, right? So you're worried specifically that it'll reveal something about you because you agreed to have your data included in this computation. So um, this is sort of an important idea that we're going to consider a counterfactual where we ran the mechanism on the same data set, except we've taken your data out of it, or we've maybe replaced it with some you know, dummy record or something. But we've, we basically stripped anything specific to your sample out of the data set. And we want to argue that the conclusion that we reach should not depend in a significant way on which of these two cases we're in, whether we use the real data set or whether we use the data set with you stripped out of it. And what that means is that no attacker should be able to learn too much about you because your data was sampled. Okay, so the fact that you were sort of one of these unlucky people who was actually included in the sample should not cause any attacker to learn too much about you. And in order to get that, we have to formalize a particular condition on the mechanism that says that these two worlds are indistinguishable. Okay, and so formally, this notion of epsilon delta differential privacy says that for every two data sets that differ on one person's data, so not just your data, but you know, any one hypothetical person's data. And every possible event on the output space that could arise, the probability of that event when the mechanism is run with your data, so on X, shouldn't be too different from the probability of that event when the mechanism is run with uh, this hypothetical data set X prime. And at that level of uh, uh, you know, generality, uh, this just says that the distribution m of x and m of x prime have to be close in some sense. But for reasons I'm not going to get into, but that are important, there's a very particular notion of closeness that's used in epsilon delta differential privacy, and its form is really important. So if you ignore this delta for a second, the notion of closeness is that the ratio of the two probabilities should be upper bounded by something a little bigger than one. Okay, so for technical reasons, we typically write it as e to the epsilon, but epsilon should be fairly small. So think of this as like, you know, should increase by 10% at most. For sort of technical reasons, we also add this extra additive term of delta. So it says for really, really unlikely events, we don't really care about the pointwise ratio of probabilities. And you should think of delta as this like very, very small quantity. Um, but the key thing is really this multiplicative ratio of probabilities. So this is um, what I like to think of is this, it's a notion of sort of distribution stability or distribution robustness. It says if I change one person in the data set, let's say you, then the output of the mechanism shouldn't change much like in distribution, not just in sort of some metric, but actually as probability distributions. And this is what gives it these kind of strong semantic guarantees. Okay, so. Let me go on and let me describe like a problem that's been sort of at the heart of research on differential privacy. So like I described this definition, there's been a lot written about why this is a good definition and what it means. So of course, what, what would we like the mechanism to do? And so a problem that's received a lot of the attention is coming up with differentially private algorithms that answer statistical queries about the population. So if you've heard of the statistical queries model from Kearns in 93, um, this is essentially what I'm asking is, can we implement the statistical queries model via a differentially private algorithm? If you've never heard of this at all, that's fine. Let me just be very concrete. So we have some distribution P over some data universe U, which for today, I'll just think of as plus minus one to the D. So you have you know, D bits. So everybody in your uh, world answers D yes or no questions, for example, and that's, that's your data set. And we have some queries we'd like to answer. And the queries have this very specific form. We just want to estimate the mean of some function over the population. 
And the function is going to be for today, like a plus minus one valued function. And it's not really important. Like some of these details are, you know, more just for concreteness, but some bounded function. So for every query QJ, I'll say like QJ of P is the expected value of this predicate Q on a random point from the population. Uh, I like to abuse notation a little bit in this way. And this capital Q is going to say, well, I have a vector of K of these queries. And Q, capital Q is going to be like just the, the function that concatenates the answer to all of them, just to keep notation a little simple. Um, and then I have a data set that's drawn IID from my distribution P. And the goal is I'm given a bunch of these queries. So there's no like interaction at all. There's just a set of K queries. And I want to design some estimator M such that if I give it N samples from any, any distribution P, it approximates this capital Q of P fairly well. For today, the notion of approximate is going to be, I want to get something that's close in L infinity distance. So for every query, I want to get something that's within about one in a hundred, you know, just something a little, the, the answers range between minus one and plus one. So I want to get some kind of non-trivially good answer for every query. Some of the technical statements I make are going to be like a little fuzzy and fast and loose with whether I want say L infinity or L2 or L1, you know, I, I wanted to give something concrete, but you can study this of course in like lots of different metrics, you know, you can look at different regimes. Uh, I don't want to kind of go into to everything. Okay, so this is a very canonical problem. This lets you do lots of things. So it's like, seems very simple, but if I give you enough queries, you can do all kinds of things. So let's look at just a couple like quick baselines for what you can do in this model. So the obvious baseline, if you don't care about privacy, is just to use the empirical mean. So just pretend your data set is the population and uh, just look at the mean of the queries on the data set and return that as if it were the population. Now, obviously, a lot of the you know, talks in this workshop are about how hard it can be to infer something about the population given samples, even in the absence of privacy constraints. But for this problem, the non-private version is basically trivial. So if I get, I guess the way I wrote it, I need maybe log, log of the number of query samples, but the gist is that a very small number of samples will suffice. And we wanna know how does adding a privacy constraint make this problem harder? So we're, we're starting with a problem that's essentially trivial from a, in for, you know, without a privacy constraint, both information theoretically and computationally. Okay, so there's kind of nothing interesting going on without privacy. So there's a very simple baseline mechanism that does satisfy differential privacy. It's what sort of emerged out of the early line of work. It's like, you know, it's a little hard to figure out exactly which paper did it this way, but the gist is that it's, it's what's advised sort of out of the, the day one of differential privacy. So, you take the empirical mean, this is like a vector in k dimensions of, you know, it's a vector with answers to k queries, and you just perturb it with Gaussian noise, like independent Gaussian noise on any coordinate. So you perturb it with like spherical Gaussian noise. And if you perturb it with enough noise, I mean, it's sort of obvious that as you crank the variance up to infinity, eventually you lose all information about the empirical mean, so it should become private. So the question is how much noise do you have to add? And the answer turns out to be that the amount of noise you have to add to make this differentially private is um, about square root of the number of queries over n. So if remember, there's n samples, so it says as you add more samples, you can add less noise. But as you add more queries, you have to add more noise. And you know, I think that uh, it's not terribly insightful to like analyze this for you. But the gist is that changing one person in the data set can only change the empirical mean by a small amount in say L2 norm, because I'm taking an average of N people. If I change one person, I can only change the empirical mean um, by about root K over N. And so what this says is if I get about root K samples, I have enough to estimate the answer to my queries privately. So this is a, you know, a big gap. So even if I had maybe put this union bound in, it would be about log K samples without privacy. And suddenly I need square root of, square root of K samples with privacy. Okay, so that's a very big gap. But it turns out that you can do like much, much better than this. So I, again, I'm, I'm not really gonna go into the algorithms exactly, although I will give like a taste of how they work um, in, in the next part of the talk. 
But if you imagine you're in a setting where you have way more than D queries, you have a data set of dimension D, but you're asking you know, way more than D queries, like D to the 10 or even you know, exponential in D queries, you can do much better. So um, what emerged out of sort of the second wave of differentially private algorithms, starting with, a, I think, a really influential paper by Blum, Liggett, and Roth, but with like many subsequent algorithms that refined their ideas and, and gave very, very beautiful new ideas. So if I give you any set of these queries, so any set of K queries, there's a differentially private algorithm that accurately answers all the queries given a sample of size about square root of the dimension. Okay, so it's like, it's not a direct improvement on what we had before. Now it depends on the dimension, but when the number of queries is much bigger than the dimension, this says that the sample complexity can be almost independent of K. So again, I'm like hiding a log factor in K, but the point is that we can go from square root of the number of queries to just square root of the dimension. So we can answer even like an exponential number of queries in the dimension without really paying much for it in sample complexity. But perhaps unsurprisingly, given the preface to this talk, the big downside of this kind of second wave of algorithms is that they're not computationally efficient. So if you think about the simple baseline I described, the Gaussian noise addition, basically the bottleneck in the algorithm is just evaluating all the queries. Right? So like you start by writing down this vector with answers to all k queries. And um, then you just add, you just perturb them all with noise. So basically the, the bottleneck is how fast can you write down the queries? Now, like the way that I've written the problem, the queries themselves could take exponential time in D to evaluate, right? I just said you have some arbitrary function that maps D bits to one bit. So nothing actually says that even without privacy, I can do that in polynomial time. But the way I'll sort of think about the running time of this Gaussian mechanism is that once you're done writing down the queries, which for most natural cases would actually be very efficient, the additional time to make it private is just sort of linear in the number of queries. It's just add a Gaussian to every query. On the other hand, these other algorithms, their running time is always exponential in the dimension. So like, even if the queries are extremely simple to evaluate, even if there's just, you know, D squared queries, the running time to get these, to, to add the noise basically to get the answers to the queries to be private will require exponential time in the dimension. Okay, so, you know, once this picture sort of crystallized, it became clear that there's some interesting like computational versus information theoretic phenomenon going on. And so people of course started to ask, you know, can you do any better? And here's kind of like the picture that we got to. Um, so people started asking, you know, can you just get like a third wave of algorithms that's just efficient and works for all queries. So can you sort of do better for just worst case queries? Like any, any queries you can possibly imagine asking. And what sort of emerges is that the answer is no. So if you sort of look at my, my, my table, um, what it basically says is that if you want a polynomial time algorithm, you need the number of samples to grow square root of the number of queries. If you're willing to have an exponential time algorithm, it can just grow square root of the dimension, even when you have many more, you know, a huge number of queries. And people were able to show that, that this was sort of best possible. So the best results in this line of work, sort of the information theoretic question, can you just get rid of the square root of D completely? Can you get, you know, O of one, just this constant number of samples? So we were able to show in a paper with Mark Bunn and Salil Fadan, that's not possible. So if you want to answer a lot of queries, even information theoretically, you need about square root of D samples when the number of queries is bigger than D. Um, but also computationally, we were able to show a pretty big gap. So in work with Luke Kowalczyk and Tom Malkin and Mark Chandry, we showed that um, if I give you K, like arbitrary queries, they can be anything. The only constraint is that they have to be themselves something you can evaluate in polynomial time. So I don't want a hard problem just because the queries themselves are hard to answer. Um, so there's a set of, you know, for every K, there's a set of K polynomial time sampleable queries uh, or polynomial time evaluatable queries where the number of samples you need is polynomial in K. So I, I don't know how to get exactly K to the one half, but polynomial in K. So we are able to show like K to the one seventh where there's nothing special or interesting about seven. Um, so what 
this picture kind of says is that for the most part, we sort of understand the worst case complexity for the, of this problem where worst case is like worst case over data sets and over queries, or sorry, over like worst case over populations and worst case over queries. And there's definitely interesting open questions here. So trying to understand, for example, uh, you know, like for what types of queries can you get around this root D lower bound information theoretically? Um, but the sort of like research thrust that I think has been most interesting and where I think there's a lot of a lot of unresolved questions is basically when can you improve the computational complexity? So when can you get when can you eliminate these information compu information computation trade-offs or show that they're inherent by assuming like more structure in the queries? So assuming that you're not just answering these arbitrary queries defined by some arbitrary predicate on the domain, but something very, you know, very simple with some structure. And I think by far like the case that's received the most attention in the sort of computational picture is this example it's called the sort of M-way marginals, or you could also think of it like the, the moments of the distribution. Those might call it M-way parity queries. I think moments is actually the thing that's probably like the nicest one, but I'll stick with M-way marginals because it's just what people have been doing. So these queries are like a case that was sort of has been around since basically the beginning of differential privacy. It was kind of motivated by applications in the, the census, but it has you know, an extremely simple description for like the TCS community. Basically, um, I have some parameter M, think of M as a constant, let's say. And for every, so I have a, a domain of size two to the D, so if my domain is D bits, and for every subset of m coordinates, or at most m coordinates, I want to know the expected value when I draw a point from the population of the product of all of the coordinates in the set. So for example, s, if m is 2, s is like all for all pairs ij, I want to know the expectation of xi times xj. So this is really just asking for the like mth order moments of the distribution, right? Three. Three. What is the, why does this come up in the census? What is the? Right, okay. So um, basically like, what does the census release, right? So they collect from people uh, a relatively small number of attributes. So they collect from people like which census block you live in, which is a way of encoding your address and uh, some representation of your sex and your age and, um, some race ethnicity and the types of things they release are things like you know in census block 1402 how many people are uh non-white and of voting age and so this is this is this is intersections of a small constant number of attributes exactly yeah so it's like the the things they release can be called these sort of marginal tables where you're basically just asking for like a description of the marginal distribution if i look at you know voting age non-voting age now the, the main difference is that there you typically don't have binary features, um, but you know this is a like this is the fundamental problem at the core of what they're trying to do. Um, they're often also not interested in releasing like every single one of these. They're interested in some you know particular subset of interests, so not every set S of size up to M, but like some particular set. But I think like as stylized as this problem looks, I mean I think this is extremely fundamental and, and really does sort of capture the difficulty in a lot of the work like they do in practice. So I, I do think it's like quite connected to the practice of differential privacy. But of course, also, I mean, this captures things like, you know, again, if you relax like binary features, it's like, what is the covariance matrix of the distribution? It's you know kind of hard to have a more natural problem than that. I mean, even if you do have binary features, you can ask that question, but like, um, it's a special case of just like, what is the covariance of the distribution? So, um, so this is basically the, the problem that I, I claim is sort of open. It's like, how do you answer these queries in a differentially private way? And uh, just to see what the actual question is, so let's sort of look at what our two types of algorithms give. So if I want to do Gaussian noise addition, well, the number of queries here is about D to the M. And so that algorithm will use about D to the M over two samples. So something exponential in M. 
And even if you think of M as a constant, right, this could be some large polynomial in D. And the running time, um, you know, again, as long as M is reasonably small and we're willing to just write down all of the, say, three-way marginals, then this is a very efficient algorithm. And of course, ask if you can do something even more efficient than that, but let's not go there. Um, these more advanced mechanisms say it doesn't matter what M is. There's maybe a linear and M term here that's hiding, but for any constant M, I can get D to the one half samples, but my running time is now exponential in D. And I think I'll have enough time to sort of show you like specifically where that comes up. So this is kind of the, the state of the world. And like the question that I, I propose that, you know, people study and I would love to chat about that people look on is basically, are there computationally efficient algorithms for privately releasing M way marginals, let's say for any constant M with optimal sample complexity, or even just sort of much better than D to the M over two. So there's been a little progress on this, but not too much. And uh, the only time I've ever proposed a reward for an open problem, uh, I, the reward was that I will go out to you with you and Thomas Steinke for all you can eat sushi at a particular restaurant in Boston. And two people simultaneously solved that problem. They have not claimed the prize because of like COVID and stuff, but uh, I figure I have a good track record. So I will go out for sushi with you. You have to take, like, we go together though. You can't just like take the sushi with someone else. Does Thomas Dyke still live in Boston? It might be a long flight for him. No, a lot has changed since we proposed this reward. Yeah, it could be really hard to it was to The reward seemed much easier to give out before when we actually gave that. But it does seem to prompt progress on problems and I get to eat sushi. Um, Okay, so this so is the problem. So let me just describe like a little bit of the kinds of things that people look at. And I think at the time people were looking at these things, um, you know, I think people are taking very different approaches. So I wanted to kind of translate some of the algorithms that people have looked at into things that might be, uh, that feel like active areas of study where I think people like in this room might be of use. So um, there's sort of a line of work that I think kind of, it kind of started from a paper of mine with Anupam Gupta and Moritz Hart and Aaron Roth, um, where we tried to basically resolve this problem using algorithms from uh, learning theory, from like pack learning theory. And there's kind of a, a simple idea at the core of this. So the idea is to sort of flip the problem around a little bit. So the fun we're going to try thinking of a function that takes as input a query. So in this case, like it takes the description of like a three-way marginal. So like three coordinates as input. And what it returns is the answer to that query. Okay, like that's a perfectly well-defined function. And we're gonna try to apply learning algorithms, private learning algorithms to that function. And why is that useful? Well, what does a learning algorithm do? So it gets to see points on the function, which in this case means random queries. Right, a point on the function is like a query, so I'll sample some random queries. And I'll show you the answer to the random subset of queries. Okay, and the thing that makes learning algorithms good is that they need many fewer samples than the input size of the function. So even though there's lots of queries, a good learning algorithm for this problem would be able to take the answer to a small number of queries and extract from it the answer to all the queries. Now, I need to give you private answers to the queries in the sample. Um, and I can do that using the Gaussian mechanism if the number of sampled queries is very small. So like if you only sample maybe D queries, then I can show you the answer to all the queries in the sample with just, uh, sorry, I should not be overusing sample. So let's say there's example queries. Those are like the points here you get to see. Then I want to give you an estimate of the value of the function on that query using my data set, my, my sample data set. And I can do that by adding Gaussian noise to the answers. And there's a small number of queries, so I, I don't have to add that much noise. And then you're going to try to figure out what the answer to the rest of the queries is. So kind of the standard learning paradigm, you're gonna to try to fit a function that agrees with all of the queries you've seen so far, and hopefully also generalizes to unseen queries. And as you know, there's a trade-off between the function class and the sample and computational complexity. So, um, you know, in fact, you can basically get optimal algorithms just by noting that there exists a way of, there's an information theoretic way to do this using only about D samples for the class of queries I described, but the learning problem wouldn't be solved efficiently. But we were able to give, um, say, non-trivial algorithms this way. So 
for example, using sort of techniques based on Chebyshev polynomials, we were able to show that you can uh, improve the sample complexity to something that's d to the order square root of m, the sub exponential in m, with about the same running time. So the running time, I guess, is still d to the m uh, to write down the queries, but the running time overhead is smaller. So, I mean, the, the point is not so much to go into this result, but that this is like a paradigm for how you might try to solve this problem. You can cast it as a sort of private learning problem where you're trying to come up with an efficient way of seeing the answers to a small number of these marginal queries. And you're somehow trying to infer answers to the rest of the marginal queries accurately. Um, and that approach sort of stalled out. And with the benefit of hindsight, I think the reason that this approach stalled out is because it's essentially like an instance of this noisy tensor completion problem. So if you think about what this function is for marginal queries, it's like I give you m coordinates. And then I ask you to tell me the product of those m coordinates and then average over elements of the population. So what this function really is, is it's like the, the function that tells you a certain coordinate in this like rank one or the convex combination of rank one mth order tensors. So that's a problem that's been studied, of course. Um, I'm sure there are people in this room who know more about this problem than me. But the sort of punchline is that information theoretically, if I give you order, about order D entries in this tensor, there's actually a way to recover the missing entries. You can complete the missing entries in the tensor. But um, at least what I know about this problem is that there's a paper by Barak and, and Moitra showing that under certain refutation assumptions, um, any computationally efficient algorithm for tensor completion, even with a third order tensor, requires it has to see about d to the three halves entries of the tensor. And that sort of translates to saying that if you're working in this framework, any private algorithm would have to have a suboptimal sample complexity, which is at least d to the three fourths. But this, and, is all, this yeah. would already be better. If you could get d three quarters for m equals three, this is already better than your naive thing, right? <laughs> it is, the yes. The naive thing was, would have been three halves. The naive thing would have been three halves, yes. So you can do better. And I mean, there's a the converse to this is that you can basically take an algorithm for tensor completion right. and you can actually get you should be able this to is an upper bound as well. In general, d to the m over four, right? Should yes, in general, d to the m over four. So, um, and that is, no, I mean, I guess, as I said, those are the, the state of the problem. I didn't say that there were some non trivial upper bounds. Uh, one of them I stated on the last slide. One is this one you're, you basically figured out. But um, yes, basically, this says you can't get better than d to the omega m using this, like, um, using this approach, at least for constant m. Yeah. Okay, so this is one place where there's kind of a like a, a barrier is that this approach seems to be running into this barrier, which is this like tensor completion barrier. So there's some rigorous evidence for information theoretic trade offs in com information computation trade offs in tensor completion, uh, which only capture this one style of algorithm. So let me describe, I've got like eight minutes left. So I'll sort of describe one other style of algorithm very briefly. And then I'll, a bit more now, so okay. 13. Uh, you know, the point is basically I've been, you know, doodling slides for the last 18 months with no one to show them to. So like I could be talking forever if no one cuts me off. Okay, so I'm gonna describe one other approach that comes from a really elegant paper by Nikola Talwar and Zhang that is, um, I think spiritually quite, related, but it has some slightly different features that make me think it's interesting to study. Um, so it, their mechanism is called the projection mechanism. So they don't cast the problem as a learning problem. What they do is they say, let's just start with the trivial algorithm. So let's just start by taking the, uh, we'll just write down all d to the m answers to the queries, and we'll just use this Gaussian mechanism. And we'll add so much noise that it's private like anyway. So even though we have to add a lot of noise, in fact, when the number of samples we have is small, we have to add so much noise that the answers don't even live between negative one and one anymore. They're like totally you know, way outside the realm of plausibility. But what we'll do is we'll say, OK, you know, good. So our answers are not consistent with any actual distribution. These cannot actually be the nth moments of any distribution anymore. They've completely lost their, their like tensor structure. So let's basically just project back into the set of answers we could have gotten that are actually consistent with some distribution. So you can define this polytope K. And this polytope K, it's just sort of the, 
It's the set of possible answers you would get to all of the moment queries if these were the real answers on some population. So it's like a polytope that's like the convex hull of two to the d different vertices. Each one, each is defined by a, a, a vector in plus minus one to the d. So I started with my, my true answer here. It's this blue dot y. I've like added some crazy amount of noise to make it private. So I have this point y tilde that doesn't even live in k anymore. So let's just project it back into the polytope and like in the obvious sense, like in L2. And first thing I should have one nice property of differential privacy is that once I have the purple point, I can do anything I want to it and it will remain differentially private. It's closed under post-processing. So privacy analysis is basically just this purple point, sort of trivial. The question then is, is this red point y hat actually closer to y than I started by like a non-trivial amount? And the answer is yes, if this polytope K has low what's called Gaussian width. So the, what you can show is that the distance between the blue point and the red point is proportional to the Gaussian width of this polytope. And uh, the Gaussian width, if you haven't seen it, it says, um, I draw a standard normal G and I look at the largest inner product of G with anything in the polytope in absolute value. And I look at the expectation over G of that quantity. So it's like a relaxation of having bounded diameter. And what you can show is that as long as K has bounded Gaussian width, small Gaussian width, um, this will be very accurate. It will be information theoretically basically optimal. So what's really surprising is that I'm taking this mechanism that adds such a crazy amount of noise that the answers look useless but they're actually enough information theoretically to recover very good answers. In fact, information theoretically, the best answers we could get with privacy. So, uh, I'm sorry, I should say. So obviously this projection is not efficient because this is projecting onto the convex, the convex hull of you know, third order tensors defined by like a binary vector, but we can try some sort of relaxation. And, um, our goal could be to find some sort of efficient relaxation of this set K that also has low Gaussian width and emits efficient projection. And in a follow-up paper, Dwork, Nikolov, and Talwar found such a relaxation based on, on STPs. And it doesn't quite give D to the M over four. It has this sort of you know, parity issue. It gives like D to the M over two ceiling over two, but you can use sort of you know, fancier ideas to get it down to like D to the M over four. So. It's basically d to the m over four. I'll say morally d to the m over four. One particular consequence is this does give an optimal algorithm for m equals two. So for the second moment case, we have an optimal algorithm, but it's still not optimal for m equals three and higher. Okay, so th these are basically the algorithms we know. And you, know, you can see like this, I think sort of progress on this runs into trouble in a similar place that progress on noisy tensor completion runs into trouble, but it's like less the, the connection to refutation. I don't actually know that it goes through. So I think there's one sort of nice question there is, could you show, for example, that anything in this framework uh, cannot be efficient and optimal, say, under these like refutation assumptions? I don't know how to do that, but it seems at least closer to something that we could study. So I will uh, sort of wrap up there with this question. And let me just make sort of like one observation about kind of like why I think we're sort of stuck on these problems. So like where I think the kind of conceptual bottlenecks are. So the first one is like a little flip, but it's sort of that I think we sort of used up all the cryptography in proving the worst case lower bounds. So what I mean by that is sort of like a, an analogy to say uh, learning theory. So if you look at the history of proving hardness results for pack learning, where similar types of problems arise, uh, the history was sort of like very shortly after pack learning was defined. Uh, it was shown that if you believe in cryptography, like if, you, if there are pseudo random functions, then there's some learning problem that you can information theoretically solve, but you can't solve efficiently. And once you sort of like know what a pseudo random function is, it's like basically a very, very easy, simple reduction. You sort of use like the minimal amount of crypto that you can imagine, like minimal in the sense of like you need about one week of cryptography class to get there. Um, then if you want to show things like it's hard to learn um, you know, intersections of half spaces and stuff, you start introducing like 
fancier cryptographic constructions and uh, public key encryption schemes with nice properties and pseudo random functions that are can be evaluated in very low complexity. Um, but you have a lot of room for that because like the base hardness that's sort of the, the worst case hardness for some worst case concept class was using only the simplest crypto. Uh, in differential privacy, even to show the worst case hardness results I described, you actually need like basically like all the crypto. You need indistinguishability obfuscation is the current state of the art, which is like the uber crypto assumption. Um, and so we've kind of, you have to use so much cryptography to like try to understand even the worst case complexity of these problems, like worst case over queries that you just don't really have a lot left to, there's not a lot of tools left to use. That's in some sense, like more of a sociological statement than a technical statement, but I think it's sort of like meaningful that, that it's just very hard to even figure out like what types of like assumptions in crypto or primitives in crypto would be useful for showing that these problems are hard. Um, answer two, which I think is almost like tautological when you say it is like, we just don't really understand much about how privacy restricts the types of algorithms you can you can use. So, right, like in all of the problem in all the types of frameworks I described, what we're doing is we're like tying our hands in some way. So we're saying let's like replace the data set with some. Let's sort of imagine that we just have some sort of simple oracle. Like we get to see the answers to a small number of marginal queries, or we get to see answers to. Uh, let's, yeah, it's like a small number of queries where we get to see very, very, very noisy answers to all the queries. Like we're tying our hands and we're saying we'll tie our hands in such a way that we can sort of implement this Oracle access to P in a private way. Using like one of the few like out really like using the very simple private algorithms we know. So like just using the simple idea of adding Gaussian noise. And we'll basically ask like, what can we do with that? So if we get this very limited access to the population, you know, what can we do with that? But in reality, like we actually have this sample, like it, like we have it, like it's staring us in the face, right? We have the whole thing and we're in a regime where the sample and the population are basically interchangeable. It's not really hard to infer things about the population from the sample. And so the only thing that's like stopping us is that we have to use the sample in like a, a private way. And we just don't really have a good handle on like what type, like how can we access the data to make it like privacy friendly. So we know there's things we can do, but we don't really have a good characterization of like what, you know, how does it limit you? So it's really hard to come up with like reductions to say hard learning problems or hard robust statistics problems or any kind of hard inference problem because sort of as far as you know, like the sample is just this thing you hold, right? Like you can sort of, in principle, you can sort of do most things with it. You just have to do private things. And we, we just don't really have a sense of like what makes an algorithm private. So of course, in some sense, this is like a tautology. Like we don't know how to prove lower bounds because we don't know what the set of algorithms is. But I think there's something like conceptual here about why it's very hard to even come up with like a candidate reduction from some of these problems to say like planted problems or refutation problems. So I think that's kind of where we're stuck and hopefully I inspired some of you to think about this. So I will just stop there and take questions. Oh, I have some questions. So like in the definition of the private SQ model, you will only allow for oblivious queries. But if I want to make adaptive queries where like the second query depends on the first one, does that totally change the picture or what happens? Yeah, so great. So it's one of the slides that I basically didn't get right. So, so basically, yeah, so the way I define it, like we just have a fixed set of queries. There's just, I want marginals. Um, you can of course imagine that I sort of treat the data set is like uh, something you can access interactively. So we do know a little more about that. Like we know that that problem is in some sense harder, like it's easier to prove lower bounds. Um, but it's also in some sense like, so it's sometimes just harder, right? So it's easier to prove lower bounds. It's in some other sense, like it can be, you can think of it as easier in the sense, like maybe I have this huge set of marginals. There's like D to the hundred marginals. But I don't want to answer all of them. I just want to let you ask me for like a subset of them. So you can get into a realm where you could also imagine that it's like easier. The short answer is it's kind of just a different model. We have, um, you know, I would say that when you start thinking about these questions about like nice queries, it's a little less natural. Like I let you ask any query you want. If it's a marginal query, maybe I should have just answered all the marginal queries in the first place. 
but it is definitely something you can study. We do know that in the worst case, um, it's very hard. Basically, if I'm going to let you ask me k arbitrary queries, you uh, can't answer more than uh, yeah. I need I need root k samples to to do, do that. And that's true even without differential privacy. Or ah, good question. So that's actually so one of the reasons I didn't talk about it's actually much less that problem is much less well understood even without privacy. Um, but the short answer is. Um, if the dimension is unbounded, you might actually need root k samples without privacy. So the lower bounds are in some sense less striking. Like we have the similar lower bounds, but it's less clear that you should have been expecting to solve that problem effectively. Yeah, Sam? In the census situation you described where you do want to answer marginal queries, but actually it's only for certain subsets of the, I don't, I don't, I don't actually need all the MYS marginals. Can you take advantage of wanting, suppose there's, you know, relatively small number of MYS marginals that you actually want to know. Can you take advantage of this? Well, so if the total number you want to know the answer to is smaller than D, then you're sort of back in the case where you just have a small set of queries. They might as well even be worst case queries. Um, but even then, I guess the thing that they sort of want to do, the thing that you still sort of want to do in practice is enforce these consistency constraints. So uh, sort of even if you're in this regime where you have fewer than D queries, if the queries are overlapping in some way, you should be getting uh, some benefit out of like having these consistency constraints. And there, um, even if you have a small, a relatively small number of these uh, marginals, it, it may be it may still be hard to like find a consistent data, like a consistent set of answers. Yeah. Uh, it's essentially can sort of be thought of like inferring a sparse graphical model or something like that. So it's it's a problem where sort of more you can hope to do, but there's still some hardness there. And also, relatedly, getting back to the census motivation, it seems like there, uh, some of some of the some of the attributes ha have like a really large number of possible values, and some have much smaller. You know, like which census block? Yeah, there's a lot of census yeah. blocks. Uh, which which um, I don't know. Even, uh, many other many other attributes have fewer possible answers, although maybe. Some of them should have more than you are allowed to give on the census, but right. So, for example, the census has males and females. Maybe that should be a bit for race and ethnicity. I think there's like 63, I think, possible ways of answering the the race question, yeah, which is still way less than the number of census blocks. So, way, way, way less. Yeah. Do, does can these methods take advantage of there being fewer? Or like, what what happens when you have a lot, like, really a large number of possible values for? It seems like it gets very different from binary answers when you have. Yeah. To... Okay. So I guess I should say so for the blocks thing. Really, what they want is more of like a histogram. Like they want some set of queries, but answered on like every individual block. So there's not a lot of like I want all the blocks that have an odd number because that's not like a geographically meaningful thing. So forget the blocks then for a minute. Okay. But within a block, you're right. So you you have you group in various ways. Like you don't really care about ages and years, you mostly care about they, they use, for example, five-year blocks and things like voting age, non-voting age. Um, so you can do a lot to exploit that. So even if you have, say, like, you know, imagine the only thing you care about is representing the age distribution. Like you just want to get, say, the cumulative distribution function of ages. There's a lot of very non-trivial stuff you can do. And that, that's like a problem that's been studied a lot. And then you can sort of imagine studying the problem of like, I want to get sort of uh, a table of like, within each racial category, what is the CDF of the ages? And now you have sort of like a marginal, but where one of the features is not binary. Um, imagine you know, like, like some more complicated problems. I haven't been studied as explicitly, but yeah, you, you can definitely get into an interesting territory where you, you can do very interesting things with like univariate attributes. And then you can imagine sort of marginals of univariate attributes. Uh, John, can I ask a question? Sure, mystery person. <laughs> yeah, I'm Pravesh. Sorry, I'm joining on Zoom. Hi, Pravesh. Uh, yeah, this is uh, about this uh, DNT, uh, this even versus odd issue that you were pointing out. Um, yeah. uh, and so, if I understand correctly, or is the following understanding of the problem correct? So, I have um, d to the 1.5, I don't know, d to the 1.5 log d uh, of the triples, like, you know, three wise marginals. Right. And I have like an independent Gaussian, and I would like to certify a good upper bound, uh, you know, via some efficient relaxation on the Gaussian linear combination of this 
due to the 1.5 log D marginals and they are arbitrary marginals. Is that correct? Like uh, if I could, if I could get a relaxation that gives me a good value for this, then you know we, it would imply that the Gaussian width of the polytope you were defining is like certifiably small. Would that mean that we resolve this? Just I think it's just that he wants a uh, some 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 relaxation of the set of distributions with the small Gaussian width. The relaxation of the set of k-wise moments with small yeah. Gaussian width. It's it's um it's refuting random random Gaussian polynomials. Yeah, right. That's a good thing. Just refuting random Gaussian polynomials as opposed. So, so I, I guess I. Uh, so just just to confirm, it seems like the monomials in your case are not random, right? So that's the semi-random point, right? Like the monomials are arbitrary. The coefficients are random. So in the point in the version I was describing, you get all it's d you get all d to the d cubed entries. Ah, I see. They're perturbed with like a ton of noise. I see. So it's like it's not even like semi-random. It's like you have. All the monomials. I see. But with random coefficients. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, and okay. and you, but they're like so we you you want to it's not sort of the even odd thing. So like if you have d to the if the Gaussian width is whatever gives you like a d to the one point five algorithm for then we know how to get that via like reduction to tensor completion. So what I want is like d to the one point four. I see. Okay. Okay. That makes yeah, sense. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Sure. But I'm confused about the connection with tensor completion right now. So, so, so as you said, if I have, um, I, I look at the set of all uh, order m moments, yeah. um, and let's say that I, I just looked at the empirical means over uh, a population of size. Uh, what do we call the size of the population? Uh, it's just a distribution. Like it's an infinite population. The sample size is like n, but okay. But like I'm saying, it's without loss of generality. The sample size can be fairly small. It's like okay. A, so whatever that sample, so whatever yeah. that effective sample size is, then this set of all m order uh, moments is a tensor whose rank is that sample size. But then we add Gaussian noise to it. Yeah. But um, when you said tensor completion, I thought that meant like you're going to tell me. The values or the noisy values of a certain number of these moments. Yeah. And from that, I'm going to reconstruct the rest. Yes. So there were two frameworks. So one of them is basically I give you a subset of entries of the tensor with a small amount of noise in it. That's a tensor completion problem. Yes. But what I'm saying is, you know, tensor completion, like that's the problem we have. Here, I hold the data set. So I could I could give you the full tensor, but to do it privately, I'd have to add a ton of noise to it. Right. So there's like a spectrum of like, I could either give you a small subsample of the entries with a little noise, uh -huh. or I could give you all the entries with a lot of noise. Got it. And I only know the connection to tensor completion if you decide you're going to give me a small sample. Mm -hmm. But in principle, you could get a private algorithm in this thing you described, which is not tensor completion. And that's sort of what, what Pravesh, I think, is asking about, obviously. Uh, what, what would you sort of need to, to argue that you could get an efficient algorithm? That way? So I'm curious about this effect of sample size because that's like getting a low rank approximation to the true uh, correlation tensor or whatever we call that, the moment tensor. Yeah. And so I guess for the, since I'm interested in an entry wise error, I guess you can just always like sample uh, like one, of, if you want say like alpha error for every coordinate, you can sample like one over alpha squared elements from your population uh, log of log of the number of moments for a mean bound. And that would give you the, the right, that, that would be accurate. So it says there exists a tensor of rank about one over alpha squared that would um, log d over alpha squared that would approximate entry wise. So it, it's specific to the fact that I want to approximate entry wise. If I wanted like a approximation, say like if this were like the matrix setting and I want to approximate like for being a norm or something, I might not do a good low rank approximation. I guess uh, thanks for thanks. Those are great questions. Awesome. Neat. All right, class is dismissed.